When this specific incident occurred, I was 29 years old and driving a relatively short distance with my five-year-old daughter. My husband and I had made plans to drive to his parents' house outside the city and stay with them for a couple of weeks. My husband works late into the day, so we agreed that it would be better if I and my daughter left first and my husband would follow a couple of hours after us. It was winter, so it got dark early. We left at around 3 p.m. and by 4.30 it was already completely dark outside. We were still an hour and a half from my in-law's house and I was feeling pretty confident that we'd get there without anything bad happening. It's not like I had a feeling or anything, but as a mother, it's definitely something I thought about in the back of my mind. We were driving back down a back road that had no street lights and was otherwise completely desolate. I didn't necessarily love the feeling of being completely alone, but I tried my best to just brush it off and kept telling myself that we'd be there before I knew it. We'd driven this road countless times before and never had anything happen to us. We were 30 minutes from the house when I started seeing some flashing lights in the distance. They were two blinking yellow lights in the middle of the road that I quickly recognized as hazard lights on a car. I started getting this nasty feeling and just didn't like the fact that they weren't pulled over to the side of the road, but instead were in the middle of it. I stopped somewhere between 80 and 100 feet away and started thinking of what I should do. I was sure of one thing though, there was no way that I was stopping to help these people. I mean, I was a woman in her late 20s alone with her young daughter, I'd have to be a raging lunatic to stop to help anyone. I'd call to get them help later, but that's the best I could really do. I'm sure any other woman in my position would feel the same way. You have to put you and your child's safety first before a stranger, always. I sat there for what felt like 30 minutes and still had no idea what to do. I had no service, so calling my husband or father-in-law was not an option. I had finally made the decision to just turn around and go home and wait for my husband so we could drive there together. The only problem was that it was a two-lane road and it would take more than a three-point turn for me to turn around and start heading back. I started to hesitate, but when I looked in my rearview mirror, I noticed some shadows running up quickly in the distance behind my car. I could see them slightly in the moonlight, but I couldn't make out what they were. They had gotten around 30-ish feet behind my car when I realized that they were people, and I think they were carrying something. I couldn't sit there anymore. I couldn't even think. It was like my body reacted before my brain did. I put the car in drive and floored it. It wasn't a crazy fast car or anything, but it did what I needed it to do. I was speeding right towards the stop car and had no choice but to drive onto the side of the road past them as best I could. As I passed, I saw more people started to come out from the side of the road. They started throwing things, pretty much anything they could get me to stop. I sideswiped one of the people and they fell back onto the road. Something hit my windshield and it even shattered a little bit, and whatever it was went flying into the passenger seat. I screamed from the impact and felt bad because my screaming made my daughter begin to scream and cry and I told her everything was going to be okay but she was five and nothing I could say at the time was going to make her feel any better. I just kept driving forward, not letting up on the gas. I was trying to build as much distance as possible between us and those people and before I knew it we were pulling up into my in-law street. They had a guard gate in the front and I pushed the button to be let in and they immediately could tell that I was in distress when they answered the gate. We were let in and my father-in-law met me at the driveway with his gun. I was bawling and my daughter was sobbing into her grandma's shoulder. They brought us inside and I told them everything that had happened. My father-in-law has always been very protective of me and my daughter and I could tell how angry he was getting. He kept asking me if they had followed us here and honestly I had no idea. I hadn't been paying attention to the cars behind me, I just was focused on getting to their house where I knew we'd be safe. My in-laws are the kind of people that are very serious about their security. They have countless firearms and security cameras everywhere around and inside their house and property. They check the cameras and notice the same car passing by the front gate over and over like it was driving down the street, turning around and coming back multiple times. We decided it was time to call the police but when they did, they said that they couldn't do anything for us since it wasn't technically an emergency and it was so far outside their city limits. 
I guess when you live far enough outside the boundaries of where the local police typically serve, they can only help in life or death situations. My dad very explicitly told them that if anyone entered their property, they would be shot on sight. They told him it was within his rights and that was it. He armed me and my mother-in-law and told us to wait inside the house. He called my husband who was still an hour away and went outside to check the property. We watched the security cameras and just as he was approaching the gate, the car pulled up again. But this time it stopped, right at the gate. Two people got out of the car and they clearly hadn't spotted my father-in-law walking up to the gate. They tried pushing it open and because we couldn't hear what was going on, all we saw was my father-in-law run up to them and fire a shot in the air. We could tell he was screaming something at them but we didn't know what. They scrambled back into the car and sped off quickly. We weren't sure if they'd be back but I had a feeling that that was the end of it. My husband got to the house an hour later and kept continuously apologizing to me for having me drive alone but I kept telling him that it wasn't his fault and the outcome would have been the same if he was with us. We were safe and that's what mattered. A couple of days later we heard the news that there had been a few carjackings in the area but thankfully no one was seriously injured in the process. I still hate to think about what would have happened if I hadn't seen those people sneaking up on us behind the car. What would they have done? I don't even want to know. I'm grateful we're okay, and I will say that I don't drive anywhere at night without protection, whether that be my husband or a gun. So I've come to find that dating online can be crazy. Let me just say that before I say anything else. You see pictures of someone online, talk for a while and then meet them, not even knowing for sure that they're the person in the picture. It's really absolutely insane. I only wish that I knew that before downloading Tinder myself. I had gone on a few dates with guys that I met on Tinder but nothing ever worked out. Most guys just wanted hookups or aren't ready for commitment. Of course there are also some creeps but I didn't come across those types too often. After having Tinder for a few months, I met a guy on the app who seemed way too good to be true. He was absolutely gorgeous, and when he messaged me, I was so excited. I got even more excited the more we talked when I realized that we had so much in common. He was so nice and funny, and from what he told me about himself, he really seemed like my dream guy, you know? After a round of week of talking, he asked if I wanted to hang out. I suggested a bar near my house, but he wanted to go to dinner instead. I usually like to get drinks on a first date so I could leave quickly if it went bad, but I like this guy so much and he seemed different so I agreed to dinner. For purposes of anonymity, we'll just call him Oliver. Now I was just going to drive to the restaurant myself, but he insisted on picking me up, saying it was the gentleman's thing to do and so on and so forth. It wasn't the best idea to say yes, but I guess I'm not as smart as I think I am because I agreed and I gave him my address. He said he'd pick me up around 7pm the next day and man I was really happy. I told all of my friends where we were going and they told me that I was an idiot for giving a guy I'd never met my address. I thought that they were all just being jealous so I didn't take their comments to heart. I started getting ready around 6 and at exactly 7 my doorbell rang. I opened the door and immediately was disappointed by what I saw. He looked nothing like his pictures, well not nothing like them. It was obviously the same person, but at least 10 or 15 years older. I didn't say anything and I figured that I'd go on the date and see how it went because I did still like his personality, over text at least. He opened the door for me and walked around to the other side and got in. We started driving in the direction of the restaurant and that was around 30 minutes away. He told me how gorgeous he thought I was and that I was even prettier than my pictures and then very awkwardly he said, what about me? Am I even more handsome than my pictures? At first I thought he was joking. He had to be right. There was no way that he didn't know that he was much more unattractive than whenever he took those pictures. I really didn't know what to say, but my mom has always told me to be honest so I decided a half-truth was better than nothing. I said he looked good, but that I was curious how long ago he had taken those pictures. It was immediately obvious he took offense to the question so I quickly apologized and told him to forget I ever asked. 
I was hoping we could move on from that, but he clearly took it very personally and proceeded to give me the silent treatment for the next five minutes, like some big baby. I had really begun to regret the decision to go out with him and definitely regretted giving him my address. I knew the way to the restaurant, so I was keeping track of where we were going as he drove. I noticed that he missed the turn on the street where it was located and I told him to just do a U-turn at the next intersection, but he didn't respond. He passed the next intersection and I started to get a little freaked out. I told him again that he needed to turn around and again I got no response. He drove along the road and I asked him over and over what he was doing and where we were going, but he refused to even look at me. We stopped at a red light and I knew that I just had to get out of that car. I went to open the door, but I saw that it was locked. There was no button to unlock it and it was one of those locks that retracted inside the door so I couldn't even manually do it myself. I was trapped. I took my phone out and as discreetly as possible, I texted my friend my location. After driving for some time, Oliver pulled into an empty parking lot outside a grocery store. He parked in a spot on the far end of the lot. I didn't know exactly what he planned to do, but I had an idea that I was not at all about to let that happen. He took off his seatbelt and I reached in my purse. He grabbed my arms and tried pinning me down. I fought back against him and tried as hard as I could to keep him off of me. Finally, he let go of my arm and I pulled out my pepper spray and I sprayed him directly in the face. The only problem was with using pepper spray in such a confined space is you end up getting it on yourself as well. My eyes immediately began to burn and water as he screamed in the seat beside me. He started calling me every name in the book as he tried wiping his face with his shirt, and during the struggle, I was able to reach over to him and unlock the doors. I shoved it open. I fell out into the ground, scraping my knees in the process. By that point, I was having trouble seeing clearly and my chest had begun to burn from breathing in the fumes from the pepper spray. I tried standing but was so dizzy. I kept falling back to the ground. I stumbled as I slowly made my way across the lot. I heard his door open and him yelling at me to come back over. I looked back and through all the blurriness and tears I saw him tripping over himself as he followed me. I screamed for help, but no one was around to hear my cries. Oliver started to say that he was just joking and that he didn't mean to freak me out. He said if I just came back to the car with him we'd go to the restaurant as planned and that he was sorry, and he says this in between screams of pain from his eyes burning. It was terrifying, and I genuinely wondered if he thought that I was actually going to believe him and go back to the car with him. Is he really that stupid? He was close behind me within no time, and just as I reached the doors of the grocery store, he grabbed me by the shoulders and yanked me back. But the doors had already opened, and I screamed for my life. I saw a man came running out and told Oliver to get off of me, which he then did immediately. And the man helped me up and tried to keep Oliver there, but there was no stopping him from getting back in his car and driving away. The police were called in that moment and they told me that they'd open an investigation, but nothing ever came of it. And believe it or not, this guy was never found. I moved out of that house that I was living in at the time and just moved back in with my parents. I started to get really paranoid for a while that he would find me, but it still hasn't happened. I use my story now as a cautionary tale for other women going down the same path that I once was. Even you men out there, you never know who wants to hurt you, but it can and does happen, so please be careful. My girlfriend and I are the adventurous type. We like to go out of the house as much as possible doing literally whatever outdoor activity we can do. This time, we decided late in the day that we wanted to go camping for around a week. Neither of us have the typical job where your hours are set, and the best way I can explain it is that we basically work for ourselves when it comes to our scheduling, but in the grand scheme of things we work for a larger company. We packed our bags and headed towards the campsite. It's a state park where you can camp for free for up to 14 days without permits or approval needed. We were driving along a dirt road for a while and I made the horrible mistake of not turning on my high beams. 
I don't know why it was something I hadn't thought of doing, and it would prove to be something that I'd regret for the rest of my life. It didn't help that I was also going way too fast for the terrain and time of night. Within a split second, my girlfriend screamed, and only feet in front of the truck, we both saw a large downed tree in the middle of the road. There was little I could do other than slam on the brakes and hope that we could stop before hitting the tree. Of course, we weren't that lucky. We crashed into the tree and I was out for a couple of seconds. I remember waking up really groggy and the ringing in my ears was very intense, but my main priority was making sure that my girlfriend was okay. For purposes of streamlining the story, I'll just call her Jessica. I looked over at Jessica and she was completely out. It was dark, but the moon was lighting up her face enough for me to see that her eyes were closed. I yelled her name to try to wake her up, but she wasn't responding to it at all. I took my phone out of my pocket and turned on the flashlight and pointed it at her. I didn't really know what to expect, but what I saw was something I definitely would not be able to predict at all. I saw the blood first. She was wearing a white shirt, so it was pretty apparent. And then, of course, I noticed the tree branch puncturing through her chest. It wasn't a huge branch. It was probably the same circumference of maybe like a finger or something. I know that's kind of a strange comparison, but I literally can't think of anything else to compare it to. It had come through the windshield, and it was still attached to the tree. I didn't want to shake her because I didn't want to cause any more trauma to her body in the process of trying to wake her up, so I just didn't touch her at all. I tried calling 911, but there was no service. I started trying to think of what I could do to help her, but there were so few options. The truck wouldn't even start, so even if driving away was the right idea, it wasn't an option. I had a knife in my pocket, so the next logical solution in my mind was to cut the branch from the tree and try to get her out of the truck and lay her down on the side of the road so I could get help knowing someone wasn't going to crash into our truck and only make things worse. I hopped onto the hood of the car and tried so hard to cut that branch but the knife was small and I was getting nowhere with it. I started to panic. It had already been over 30 minutes and she still hadn't woken up. I got back into the truck and I just started to pray. And that was weird for me since I hadn't prayed since I was a kid, but at this point I was willing to try anything. It felt like I was praying for hours, but only another 30 minutes had passed. I was only holding on to this glimmer of hope because she wasn't actively bleeding during that one hour. The branch wasn't in the center of her chest, so I was hoping that it missed her heart. I felt her pulse, and it wasn't strong, but it was still there. All I could do was wait for someone to hopefully come along and help us. I don't know if it was God or luck, but I started to see light coming from behind us. It filled the inside of the truck, and I got out as fast as possible and started screaming and waving at the driver. He stopped right behind her truck and rolled down his window and asked what was wrong. I started explaining to him fast and he told me to slow down since he couldn't understand me. I explained slower and the expression on his face changed instantly when he realized what I was saying. He got out of his truck and went over to the passenger side door with his flashlight and shined it on Jessica. I heard him curse under his breath and told me that the only hope that she had would be to cut the branch and try to drive her down the mountain to the EMT station since he also had no service. He had a chainsaw in the back of his truck and I was terrified the shaking of the branch would hurt her even more, but there really was no other choice. He started sawing about a foot in front of her chest. I covered her with a blanket to try to minimize any sawdust from getting in the wound. It did vibrate her body a little bit, but she wasn't conscious, so at least she wasn't in pain, so I thought. Finally, she was free from the tree. The man helped me pick her up as gently as possible and we placed her in the back seat of his truck laying down. I got into the passenger side and the man turned around and began driving down the mountain. Jessica stayed unconscious the whole time. It took us 20 minutes to get to the EMT station that I didn't even know was there. They were surprised to see us since usually they get called to emergencies. They loaded her into an ambulance and I got in with her. And the nearest hospital wasn't too far away, thank God. But it wasn't a trauma center, so she had to be airlifted to the bigger city that was around an hour away by helicopter. She had a punctured lung, but thankfully she hadn't lost much blood and her heart wasn't damaged at all. The doctor said that if it had been only an inch to the left, it would have pierced her heart 
and she probably would have died within minutes after the accident. She stayed in a coma for almost two weeks, and when she eventually woke up, she could barely speak because of the pain that she felt in her chest. She stayed in the hospital for over two months. She had intensive surgery to try to repair all of the damage, but it's possible that she might even need a transplant for her lung in the future. I'm just grateful Jessica survived and have stayed in touch with the man who saved her life. Jessica is currently still on oxygen and has trouble breathing from time to time. I take her to monthly appointments and we're doing everything we can to hopefully someday see her fully recover, although we have come to terms with the fact that that may never happen. I asked her to marry me while she was still in the hospital, and she said yes, and no matter what happens, I'm looking forward to spending the rest of our lives together. I'll never forget that night, and oftentimes I struggle to forgive myself for what happened, but I'm also glad it's something that she doesn't have to remember. I really wasn't planning on telling this story, but it's been a few years and I'm not as freaked out by what happened as I used to be, so why not? I was only 19 at the time. I moved across the country the year before college and had never had any issues driving home for the different breaks that we had over the school year. It was winter break and my mom really wanted me to come home that year to celebrate the holidays with my family since I hadn't the year before. I agreed, but I really didn't want to leave my car for weeks. There had been a lot of car break-ins in the city that I lived in and leaving my car to be vandalized, broken into, or stolen just was not an option to me. I told my mom that I'd be driving home and she wasn't too happy about it but understood. She offered to have my dad fly out and drive with me but I didn't want them to go through all that trouble and I thought a few days on the road by myself would be a good thing. I've been having issues in my personal life and having the time to think about it without any distractions seemed like a good thing to me. I packed up a few bags that would last me the next few weeks and said bye to my roommate who was pretty bummed out about me leaving and headed out the door. Thinking back on it now, my car probably wasn't worth what I went through during that drive home. It was a 20 year old Honda Civic that had the propensity to break down a lot, and by a lot I mean at least once a month. I just didn't have the money to replace it. I hopped in the car and was on the highway within a few minutes. I got some coffee before heading out of the city so I could stay awake as long as possible. It was still around 8 in the morning so I figured I'd drive for around 10 hours before hopefully finding a hotel and settling in for the night. I had no definite plans and was following the fastest route home which probably wasn't the best decision. I know now that I should have taken the route that didn't involve long stretches of highway with nothing but fields for miles and miles. I stopped a few times for a bathroom and snack breaks and by at around 7pm I was done. I had been driving for almost 11 hours and didn't want to be a hazard to myself or others on the road if I kept driving while being that exhausted. I found a relatively nice hotel and got a room for the night and continued my drive the next morning. That day I'd be driving through parts of the Midwest and it wasn't necessarily something I was looking forward to. The last time I drove through it, it was a lot of just flat land and cornfields. Both things I thought were boring to look at on a long road trip. It was winter though, so there was no corn. The weather could have been better, but I had no issues the day before, so I hoped that it would stay that way. The day went by faster than the previous one and the sun was down before I knew it. By 6pm I was feeling pretty good to keep going, so I passed through the next city and drove on. Around 7 I started hearing a knocking sound and wanted to cry when I realized that it was coming from my engine. It had started to snow and my car began to creep along the road until I pulled to the side of the road where it completely gave out. It was getting cold without the heater on and I knew that I had to get help very soon. I checked Google Maps to see if I was close to another city, but the next town, albeit a very small one, was still almost an hour away. I tried calling my parents to tell them what happened, but my service was completely out. I decided to use the emergency calls only button on my phone to call for help and thank god it worked. The only problem was the closest officer that could respond was at least an hour away in the town that I mentioned earlier. I told the dispatcher that obviously I'd wait and she instructed me to lock the doors and try to hide myself inside the car enough to where it looked as though no one was inside. 
Apparently, right where my car decided to die on me also happened to be a very sketchy section of the highway that wasn't very safe for stranded drivers, especially young women. I'm not gonna lie, having the dispatcher tell me that made me feel physically ill. I felt like I was gonna have a heart attack with how fast my heart was racing. I put up a sunshield in the windshield area and thankfully had three extra ones in the car from when I went car camping and decided to put those along the sides and back windshield as well so no one could see it and it would look like almost black from the outside. Around 30 minutes into me waiting, I started getting the feeling like somebody was watching me. Now I tried convincing myself that it was just because of the situation that I was in and that all the windows were covered anyway so there was no way that that was possible. I wanted to shake it off, but the feeling just wouldn't go away. No matter how much I told myself that I was okay, there was something inside of me telling me the situation I was in was about to get very, very scary. I turned on the screen on my phone and faced it in the direction of the windows, not knowing what I was about to see would traumatize me for years to come. At first, I felt some ease seeing only the reflection of the sun shield. I turned my phone towards the passenger side windows and in the small crack that wasn't covered, to my horror, a strip of window was visible and on the other side of the window was the face of a man pressed against the glass with a smile staring directly at me. My first reaction was this blood-curdling scream. It was a sound that I didn't know that I even had the ability to make. It was like fear itself was manifesting in sound. It almost actually rang my ears and the second the scream left my mouth, I watched as the man lifted his face from the glass and heard him begin to laugh, the most awful guttural laugh I'd ever heard. Immediately I heard the car move as the man violently tried the door handle to get access into my car. I was screaming and crying as he hurled himself around the car, howling like he was some animal between his laughing. It felt like he was taunting me in a way. I called 911 again and was screaming that I needed help now. The woman who answered the second time wasn't as friendly as the first I'd spoken to only 30 minutes prior. She kept yelling at me to stop screaming, otherwise she wasn't going to be able to help me. I was crying, trying my best to calm down as the man outside began to bang on my window with what sounded like a hard object that possibly would make it possible for him to break into my car. The dispatcher began threatening me telling me that it wasn't okay to prank 911 even though I insisted what was happening was very real. After 10 minutes of just pure agony, trying to make her understand as the man just outside my car was putting me through this, she hung up on me. And I felt completely helpless. In the moment, the only relief that I was feeling was the fact that he hadn't been able to break into my car. I called 911 again, hoping I'd get a dispatcher with more empathy and Thankfully, that was the case. A man answered and immediately took my distress into account and helped me calm down enough to get the information he needed. The officer had been sent almost 45 minutes before and now was only around 10 minutes away, and I was told that they'd have him get to me as quickly as possible given what I was going through. I was hopeful, but that hope was ripped away when I heard the sound of what was obviously a rock being thrown at my windshield. It shattered just enough to motivate the man to get on top of my hood and start stomping the windshield until it was broken enough for him to reach a hand inside. I screamed and climbed into the back seat. I was trying my best to get out of reach of this very insane and clearly dangerous person. He started tearing the windshield out of the way and his face was even scarier than it was the first time I saw it. I was paralyzed with fear as I watched him begin to climb between the glass into the car. I had no choice but to get out of the car and hope the officer was close by. I opened the door and turned on my phone's flashlight. I faced it toward the hood and was so relieved to see that he had become stuck. He was trying to climb out but wasn't able to. I then saw the beautiful flashing red and blue lights in the distance and heard the sirens as he drove closer. I started frantically waving him down and he pulled up beside me. He was out of his car in seconds and another police car was pulling up behind him only a few minutes later. I was placed in one of the cop cars and watched as they actually drew their guns out, demanding that the man climb out of the car. This crazy guy was screaming and thrashing his body around. 
One of the officers grabbed him by the ankles and pulled him out of the vehicle. The man tried biting him multiple times before being slammed to the ground and handcuffed. They put him in the back of the other car and told me more officers would be coming down to take pictures of the scene and a tow truck would be down to tow my car. I was driving to the police station and gave my statement about everything that happened. I called my parents who bought me a plane ticket home from the nearest airport which the officers were nice enough to drive me to. I wish I could tell you the man who did that to me even gave a reason as to why but he didn't. He was so mentally deranged that they said that he wasn't even fit to stand trial eventually and I guess he was taken to some state mental hospital where the last I heard he's still there. I wish that there was some justice for the hell that he put me through and maybe some people would say there was but to me it wasn't justice. He isn't being punished. I am. The memory of what happened punishes me every day. It's gotten easier to deal with as time goes by but it will always be there to torture me anytime I'm reminded of that man in the window. I was driving my truck back home from my girlfriend's apartment. There was a pretty big storm going on that night, but I figured since I only lived 10 minutes away, I'd be fine. I would have stayed at her place, but I had to work early the next day and all my work clothes were at my place. It was dark and the power had gone out. Driving in complete darkness with only your headlights to light your way isn't the most comfortable feeling. The rain was pounding down on my windshield so hard my wipers couldn't even go fast enough for me to be able to see in front of me. It was like driving blind, but I would lived in that town my whole life so I knew where to go. It was like muscle memory on where to turn and how long to drive down a street. I turned onto the road that my house was on and almost immediately I could tell something wasn't right. It was like my truck was almost floating. I felt wetness at my feet and the lights began to flicker inside the truck. There was water seeping in. In my headlights I could see the water getting higher and higher outside my truck. The water came in faster and the truck was sinking into it. The current was taking my truck further in and there was nothing I could do. I took off my seatbelt and tried opening the door on the side and it wouldn't budge. The water was at my knees now and I took deep breaths. My dad always told me not to panic in a scary situation because panicking won't save your life. I had a waterproof flashlight in my glove box and I took that out. I turned it on and looked around for anything I could break the window with. The car had shut off completely by then and the power windows were not an option. I just cleaned the truck out the day before and unfortunately that meant taking out all my tools so I could organize my box. I only had my sweater, the small flashlight, and a pocket knife at my disposal. I called 911 and was greeted by a recorded message telling me every dispatcher was currently handling a call and they'd get to me as soon as possible. And that's when I started to panic. I needed help and it seemed like I wasn't going to get any. The water was now at my belly button when I decided to squat on my seat and try to keep my head above the water as long as possible. The water seemed to be coming in mostly from the driver's side door so I grabbed my sweater and tried to plug the leak, but it didn't work. But I was desperate and willing to try anything. I was on hold for seven minutes before I finally got an answer. I told them what was going on and they were very matter of fact when telling me that I wasn't the only person in that type of flooding situation and that it would be at least 30 minutes before they could get help to me. I kept telling him that I felt like I didn't have 30 minutes, but he told me there was nothing else he could do. I asked if he'd stay on the phone with me, but he said because of the demand for emergency services during the storm, they needed as many dispatchers as they could get and if the situation got worse, I could call back again. I hung up with the dispatcher and already knew that that wouldn't be an option. If the situation did get worse, I wouldn't have seven minutes to wait on and hold to tell someone about it. I'd be dead. The water kept rising and my heartbeat quickened. I was scared and confused why I wasn't getting any help and my mom and dad both weren't answering their phones. I opened the voice recorder app and started recording my goodbyes to my family. I wasn't sure if they'd get them, but it was better than nothing and somehow easing my nerves. It was like I was talking to them without literally talking to them. But something about it was kind of therapeutic in the moment. Only 10 minutes after I hung up with 911, 
the water had begun to reach my chest. I was certain that I was going to die when only one foot of the car had space for air. I started praying to God to please not let me die, but if I did, to let me go to heaven. I hadn't been very religious in my adult life until that exact moment, but I guess that's how it goes, usually. You realize your true belief in God when you really need Him. But anyways, another five minutes went by and it was at my neck. I had my cheek pressed against the roof and I couldn't help but cry. I was beginning to lose hope. No one was coming for me. I was only able to breathe through my nose when I heard the sound of an engine nearby. I didn't think that they'd even notice my truck so I started screaming and flashing my light to get their attention and I felt this sense of relief when I heard this boat pull up next to my truck. I shone my flashlight and saw someone jump into the water next to my driver's side window. He had this window breaker with him and it shattered on the first try. He reached into the truck, grabbed onto my shirt. I took a deep breath as he pulled me out of the truck through the window. They got me on board the boat and I began just thanking them profusely for saving my life as I took deep breaths of the air I thought only minutes before I was about to run out of. They wrapped an emergency blanket around me and we were off. We helped a few more people out of the cars before reaching an area where police and firemen were waiting. I was taken to a hospital, but I didn't have anything medically wrong with me, thank God. Thankfully, no one did die during that storm, although I know that I came very close to being the one fatality. I felt so failed by my city's emergency services, and I found out that night that the people that saved me weren't even officers. They were just good Samaritans that heard people were in trouble and knew that they had to help. For months after the incident, I had nightmares about drowning. Even now, I get scared to drive during a storm or even go out on a boat. Deep water terrifies me. I've gone to therapy a few times, but it never seemed to help, so I just stopped. I just hope there's a day, hopefully soon, where I can fully move on from what happened and not let it haunt me like it does right now. I'm glad I survived and I'm glad the people in my community stepped up when law enforcement wouldn't. I should have never been left there to die and that's exactly what they ended up doing. I only hope no one else gets stuck in the same position and if they do, I hope someone gets to them in time and that their life is spared like mine was that night. I had just gotten off a close to 24 hour shift. I worked in construction and management had no problem overworking us if there was a deadline and we weren't close enough to being done. We were given overtime so a lot of us were fine with it. I was driving home from the job site and because it was close to 3 in the morning there weren't many other cars on the road. I gotta admit that I was way too tired to actually drive. I've been up for almost 40 hours total and yeah, I was being reckless but wanted so badly to get home and just go to sleep. I was drifting to sleep a few times during my drive home but was immediately woken up by the sight of a young girl sitting by herself on the side of the road. I passed her at first but my gut told me to just turn around and see if she needed help. I pulled up beside her and she looked up at me. She couldn't have been any older than seven or eight years old. I asked her what was wrong or if she needed help but she wouldn't say anything. I felt wrong leaving her there so I opened my car door and told her to get in and that I wasn't going to hurt her. She was a little hesitant at first but she got in anyway. I planned to take her to the nearest police station so they could hopefully find out who she was and get her back to her family. I tried numerous times to get her to tell me anything about herself but she said nothing and instead just continued to stare at me. Her eyes were on me the whole time. We drove in silence for another 10 minutes when I saw another child sitting on the side of the road. I felt like I was going crazy. There was no way this was happening again. I pulled over and this time it was a little boy and he also wouldn't say anything. And I figured, hey, why not? Jump in the car. And they did with zero hesitation. I started asking him the same question that I asked the girl, but just like her, he didn't speak and he also just kind of stared at me. I started getting a little freaked out and worried that I'd just gotten myself in the middle of something very, very serious, but I knew that I had to help these children no matter what. I started to think about what it could possibly be, 
Were they kidnapped and then abandoned on the side of the road? Was it some kind of trafficking situation? Were they lost? I had no idea. Another 15 minutes go by and it happens again, only this time there's a car seat on the side of the road. I pulled over and got out and was horrified and shocked to see a little baby inside. I couldn't tell the age but it looked relatively healthy. It was looking up at me and I knew that I had to take it to the station with me and I put the car seat in the back of the car and called the police the second I got service. They instructed me to go to the hospital that was a few miles away and that they'd meet me there. We arrived shortly after the call and I pulled up to the front. I got the car seat out and instructed the children to follow me inside and they did so without saying a word or making a fuss. I walked inside and only the receptionist was there. I told her what was going on, but the only response that I was met with was this very confused look on her face. I motioned the children to go up to her and they just stood next to her. I kept asking her for help but she just looked around and wouldn't do anything and I didn't understand why. She kept asking me if I was okay and I didn't know why. I told her I was fine but that the children needed help and the baby looked cold. She asked me over and over what children I was talking about and no matter how much I pointed at them or told her where they were, she acted like she had no idea what I was talking about. I was getting frustrated and at this point I had no idea what to do. She told me to repeat myself and I just told her again exactly what happened. The whole time I told the story she just looked where I was pointing but something was off. It was like she was looking through the children instead of at them. Just as I was finishing the story, two officers walked in. She had me tell the story again to these officers who were just as confused by it as she was. They looked around for the children that were standing right in front of them and then I was getting confused. They had me sit down and very calmly told me that there were no children with me and I was carrying a tool bag, not a car seat. I looked down and still saw the car seat in my hand and the children standing nearby and begged them to get them help and reunite them with their families, but they were adamant and very serious about what they were telling me. They told me over and over that there was no one there and that I was having some sort of episode. I've never had any mental health issues and I told them that but it didn't matter. I was admitted under a 72 hour psych hold because they thought I could be a possible danger to myself or others with the hallucinations I was having. They were worried mostly because I was so sure of what I was seeing. I thought that they were all crazy and that only I was the sane one. For the next few days, I was given many tests and evaluations to try to figure out what was going on with me. At first they thought it was from sleep deprivation. It's common for people to hallucinate from lack of sleep, but when the hallucinations continued even after hours of sleep, they knew that there was something else wrong. I was scared. I called my mom who came down and went through our family's medical history with the doctors and after the 72 hours were up, I decided to just stay at the hospital. I didn't understand what was happening, but I knew that I needed help. For the next two weeks before my diagnosis, the children followed me everywhere. They watched me sleep, they kept me company, but still they wouldn't speak. At first they were comforting, like I wasn't alone, but eventually they became a reminder of the fact that something was wrong with me and I wasn't able to live my life until they figured out what it was. The hallucinations stopped being my only symptom though. I started having speech problems and couldn't think straight, and that's what tipped off the doctors that it might be something else. They'd done scans but had seen nothing, I was told if the last MRI they were going to do during that particular hospital stay showed nothing, that I'd have to leave and come back on a later date for more scans that would hopefully show more. I knew what they meant. If I did have some sort of brain tumor, I didn't want to have to wait for it to grow before they could do something about it. We did the MRI and thankfully, one doctor of what seemed like way too many noticed a shadow. I did have a brain tumor. It was small, but it explained all my symptoms. It was determined to be a malignant frontal lobe tumor that was compressing the optic nerve and unfortunately it wasn't something they could operate on due to its close proximity to the optic nerve, but they were hopeful chemo and radiation would kill the cancer cells since it had been caught so early. I started chemo and radiation and after a few weeks, the hallucinations occurred less and less. Part of me misses them when they aren't there but most of me was happy that it meant that I was getting better. 
Most people probably wouldn't understand, but maybe some will. I'm still currently undergoing treatment and my doctors are hopeful that I'll be in remission soon. I'm grateful for what happened that night. If I hadn't seen those children in the road, hallucination or not, I never would have gone to the hospital and they never would have caught the cancer that early on. I'm still not positive on my official prognosis, but I like to think it's good. I have to have hope. Otherwise, I have nothing. I was 16 and had just gotten my license. Think of the typical self-absorbed idiot 16-year-old guy. Yeah, that was me. It was Friday night and I was begging my mom to let me take the car to meet up with friends to hang out and she was adamant about that not happening. She kept saying that I was probably going to go out drinking and she didn't want me to be an idiot and drive drunk. I kept telling her that I wasn't going to, but she was setting her decision. I told her that I hated her and I went to my room, set my own decision to sneak out later and take the car. Around 11pm, my mom was asleep in bed and I didn't have to worry about my dad hearing me because he was out of town. I opened my window and hopped out into the front lawn. I had already taken the keys earlier in the night so as quickly and as quietly as I could, I got in the car and drove away. My mom forced me to install Life360 on my phone so I just turned it off to prevent her from knowing where I was if she did notice that I was gone. She was the type of mom to call the police to go looking for me if I wasn't home when I was supposed to be. I texted my friends and asked them where they were and, of course, they had driven to LA. I was over an hour away from where they were and I hate to say it, but I still decided to go. I was on the freeway for a while because of traffic and decided to take some side streets because I hoped it would be faster. It really wasn't, but that's just the joys of living in Southern California. Traffic everywhere, all the time. Well, eventually I got lost and I didn't want to turn my phone on to look at a map, so I tried to get myself to a freeway to hopefully find my way to get back home. Time was going by so fast, and the later it got, the more lost I felt like I was getting. It's not easy for me to admit, but I was scared, and honestly, I wanted my mom. I was going down side roads, alleys, and through some not-so-safe-looking neighborhoods, not really thinking about my own personal welfare. I turned down another narrow road and was shocked to see a truck blocking the way. It was parked sideways like it was deliberate. I tried reversing but was met with a man, now pointing a gun at my face, pounding on my window. I started sweating and I didn't know what to do so I did as I was told. He told me to open the door and get out so I did. He pulled me out of the car and shoved me to the ground. Another guy ran up to me and started kicking me so hard I thought my stomach was going to rip open from the force of each blow. I was begging for them to stop and screaming for help. A few other guys stood around, watching as he continued to beat me. I was lying there, just completely helpless. All I wanted as I laid on that ground was for my dad to come and save me. I knew that wasn't possible, but the thought of seeing my parents again gave me some kind of hope of making it out of there alive. I realized that an end to the beating would not come quickly so I curled up in a ball and brought my arms up to protect my head and face. Doing that must have given him the idea to start stomping on my face though because the second my arms came up, his foot came down right into my jaw. The pain that I was feeling was minimal in the moment, something I realized later was from the rush of adrenaline in my body. After what felt like forever, it finally stopped. I think that they thought I had passed out, but I didn't. I was just incapable of moving any part of my body. I saw flashes of light through my eyelids and realized that they were taking pictures of me, like they were proud of what they did. They laughed as they searched my pockets. They took my keys, wallet, and phone, and I heard them drive off with my car and all I could think about was how much I wished that I had listened to my mom and just stayed home. I remember laying there as the pain started to creep in. My jaw hurt the most, it felt like it was broken. I was able to open my eyes and in the dim light I saw all the blood spread around my body on the asphalt. I tried lifting myself up but the pain was too much. I felt tears stream down my face when I began to realize that there was a large possibility of me dying right there, 
alone on a random street, knowing the last thing I had said to my mom was that I hated her. I didn't hate her. I wanted to see her more than anything. I wished that she was there with me, getting me help and telling me everything would be okay. I must have passed out because the next thing I remember is the paramedics waking me up and asking me my name and what had happened. I was still lying in the middle of the road as they began to load me onto a stretcher as the ambulance waited to take me to the nearest hospital. I was barely able to speak, but managed to tell them my name before blacking out again, I guess. I woke up in the hospital a week later with my jaw wired shut. Apparently it had been broken from the stomp to the face. My mom was sitting by my hospital bed when I woke up, and she cried as I told her and the police all the details of what I'd been through. They said it was probably part of some gang initiation and that I was lucky to be alive. The doctors told me the same thing as they described my injuries. I had multiple broken ribs as well as a massive internal bleeding from being kicked in the torso so many times. Along with a broken jaw, I had a broken nose, other extremely painful facial fractures, but most horrifying injury of them all was the discovery that my Achilles tendons had been cut. To this day, no one can tell me why they did that and why I didn't feel it when it happened. I had to have surgery on both my ankles and even now face the possibility of even more surgeries and physical therapy before I can even think of walking normally again. I had to stay in the hospital for months before being allowed to go home. I feel so stupid for what I did, but what happened to me was literally the worst case scenario of what could happen when you take your parents' car as a teen. I'm not telling this story to make you think that this is what happens when you disobey your parents. This is not common. I guess I just want to say that sometimes your parents really do know best and when they tell you no or that something isn't a good idea, it really is because they care. They know more than you and don't take their life experience, wisdom, and unconditional love for granted. I'm a single mother. I know a lot of people will roll their eyes when they read that, but it's important to the story, so don't judge too hard. The story I'm about to tell you took place when I was in my late 30s and my two daughters were 14 and 16. I had just gotten out of an intense custody battle with her father, but thankfully was awarded full custody due to his drug addiction and rocky financial status. My girls and I were so excited to be moving to another state, away from all the drama the custody battle had caused. There was a lot of choosing sides and blame being thrown at even my daughters that we decided getting out of such a toxic environment by moving was the best idea for us. It was early June and the weather had started to warm up. We had just packed up the last boxes in our house and decided to leave a few days before the moving truck because we wanted to get settled in the house before all our stuff arrived. Even if there would be no furniture for a few days we were fine with that. We said bye to our old house, which was a very intensely emotional thing for us to do, and we set off. We were taking the fast route, and according to Google, it was only supposed to take a couple of days to get to the new house. We had the idea that we'd stay in a hotel for one night along the way, and that was super exciting for us. My girls love staying at hotels like most kids do, and I love seeing them happy. After hours of driving, it was late afternoon, and we were ready to get out of the car and find a room to stay in. I checked every hotel in the area, every app, and there was nothing available. Literally not one room was free in any of the surrounding cities for another three nights. I called around and apparently there was a huge kids soccer tournament in town and it was one of the largest in the country. We decided to keep driving until we found something, but instead, we were met with a stretch of road that had a lot of rest stops but no hotels. We stopped at a gas station to get some gas and noticed a few biker guys in the parking lot. As I waited at the pump, I noticed one of the men staring into the back seat of my car, clearly looking at my daughters who were both asleep. I felt a sort of chill run down my spine and I instantly had this gut feeling to get them out of there. It just didn't seem like a great position to be in. A young mom alone with her teenage daughters. Not great. I didn't even wait for the gas to finish pumping. I took it out, closed the gas cap got back in the car as inconspicuous as possible and got back on the highway. I watched to see if they were following us, but they didn't, and I thought maybe I had just been a little paranoid, so I stopped thinking about it. The girls and I decided to stop at the rest stop. 
We felt like it was safe enough because at the time we had pulled in, there were plenty of other vehicles and people around. I had my daughters cover the back windows with the blankets that we had brought with us, and we all fell asleep at around 8 p.m. I had the intention of only sleeping for a few hours before heading off again, but I had failed to remember to set an alarm. Instead, I was woken up by the loud roar of a motorcycle pulling up beside the car. I don't know what it is about being a mom, but every sound I hear makes me wide awake in seconds when my daughters are around. I sat up and looked outside the window and was terrified to see the same men from the gas station only a few parking spots away, and they weren't alone. There was at least 25 to 30 of them now. I was fairly positive that they hadn't seen us, so I decided to not wake the girls. I didn't want to scare them. I started the car and turned on the headlights, but no matter how much I tried to pull out of there unnoticed, it just wasn't going to happen. Something in the universe wanted those bikers to see my car and recognize it quickly. And the second my headlights switched on, every head turned and looked directly at us. I was hoping the men from the gas station wouldn't realize that they had seen us earlier, but of course, that wasn't the case. I heard one of them yell out to the buddies that they knew us and that they were a couple of hotties in the back seat. I was immediately terrified, but also rolling my eyes because who even says that? especially about two teenage girls who were obviously underage. But then again, they didn't seem like the kind of people who would care about that sort of thing. I honestly thought that if I just drove away that it would be like the last time where they wouldn't follow. But no. They were quick to follow right behind. I woke up the girls and I wish I could have been one of those moms who sugarcoated things to save their kids from being scared, but there was no way to do that with what was going on. I told them that we were being followed by some scary men and to stay down where no one could see them and keep the blankets on the windows. They both started freaking out and crying and I understood. As I sped down the highway, these bikers got more aggressive. They began throwing things at my car and swerving as they tried to run us off the road. I was trying my best to stay calm and on the outside so as to not scare the girls any more than they already were, but on the inside. I was having a full-blown panic attack. I knew my main priority had to be maintaining control of my car. It was clear that if something happened when they were successful in running us off the road, nothing good would come of that. They started yelling at me to just pull over and that they only wanted to chat. I continued to stare forward outside the windshield and not even acknowledge them, and they didn't like that. They started calling me names, demanding I roll down my window. I did roll it down about an inch to try and plead with them to just stop and leave us alone, but there was no way they could hear me. We drove like that for at least five miles before entering the next city, and by that time it was already two in the morning and finally I came to my senses and told my oldest daughter to just call the police. Through tears she told them what was going on. I don't know what they told her, but she said that they were coming. Unfortunately it just wasn't soon enough. I felt something hit the side of the car and within seconds, we were off the side of the road and headed for a tree. I slammed the brakes as hard as I could, and the car came to a very violent halt. We were all okay, but I started to wonder for how long, though. The bikers surrounded us and started pounding on the windows and pulled on the door handles while the car shook. The girls were screaming at the top of their lungs and begging me to make them go away, but there was really nothing I could do. I prayed to God that we would make it out of there and Thank God he answered my prayers. We heard sirens in the distance and watched as the men all got back on their motorcycles, speeding away. We hugged each other and cried until the officers were standing at the doors of the car. They had us step out and we explained everything. Now they tried to get in contact with the bikers around that area, but they weren't able to track them down, specifically at least. But to this day I'm still terrified every time I see a group of motorcyclists. My girls are older now with children of their own, and my biggest piece of advice to them is always carry protection. You just generally never know when you're going to find yourself in a situation as psychotic as that. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7pm EST. And there are super fun live streams every Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday night. If you've got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, 
and you might even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon, or click that big join button to hear about the extra perks offered for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all of these stories in big compilations and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, I am Foof.